Hey everyone, it's Souls here. Hope we're all doing well. Today we're going to be covering one of the most highly requested videos, without a doubt currently at this time, and that is the Shatter's Guide. There are some things that I want to be clear on before we start this Dungeon's Guide, and that is, look, it's extremely hard. So don't be disheartened if you have to break a few eggs in order to learn something new. There's currently no Shatter's Guides at the moment, but look, when they do start popping up, make sure that you check them out. There'll be some things in this video that I don't include that might be in theirs, and vice versa. I'm well aware that there are more players that are more qualified than I am, but that's kind of the point. I promise you, you don't need to be a hardcore gamer in order to complete this dungeon. You just need to know what to look out for. And that's what this video is all about. Public run, private run, or discord run by current realm conditions. I hope this video helps you, and without further ado, let's roll into it. The Shatters itself drops from a one-time spawning event in Realm called the Avatar of the Forgotten King. The Avatar of the Forgotten King is a fairly difficult fight, but I won't be covering it in this video. All I will say is that look out for the armor break and unstable shots, and everything that explodes. That including the bombs, the blow bombs, the shades, the eyes, which can explode you, the killer pillars, which also explode, and on top of that, the Avatar, which explodes himself. The Shatters will be a guaranteed spawn from the Avatar, and you can go in and head in. Now you've probably found by now that there's always a different way of clearing towards a boss, or at least in most dungeons anyway. On entering this dungeon, you'll spawn in three different locations, and I'll talk about those map types soon. One of the flaws of this dungeon is actually explaining to the player what your intentions are and what they should be. It's a moment of mystery. The real intended quest for you is to find and destroy eight scattered monoliths. Now, these can spawn in different landscapes, but I'm going to go ahead and talk to you about the three different maps and the directions that you should sort of travel around to find them. You can spawn into three different landscapes, two quadrants of the four. The names of these three maps are Church, Town, and lastly, Swamp. Knowing the spawn helps, so I'll draw for you the correct path to follow once you spawn in. For a group without anyone rushing, you'll have two ways to go, and they'll all loop around to the beginning, so I'll point those out as we go along. The first map that we can start off with is Church. Now, I've done the best I can to have it drawn out for you and listed out the best I can, and that is with blue being the rush's path, purple being your main path, green being the path to avoid as well as yellow in some cases because there's a few other areas, the red markers being the monument spawning locations and possible locations for it to be, uh, and the grids being the idle territory. Now, the green dot is where you spawn. And following through from there in the bottom left hand side of the map, you can see straight away that you want to go ahead and go right to check whether or not you have a monument there and follow the purple up and right and checking down to see whether or not there's another spot in the bottom right hand side of the map. Now you might not have rushes, and if you don't, that's okay. Follow the purple marker all the way, purple line, all the way around and checking in the idle territory just for that one last location and going ahead and following the blue line back to your spawn. You should be peeking all those locations along the way and as long as you do, when you wind up back at spawn, you'll be able to teleport to the boss and start your first boss there. Now we're going to be covering one of my favorite maps out of the three and I say favorite very leniently and that's because it is quite hard. You go through the center of the derelict village going straight up and following the purple line. You can also hug the right hand side and making sure that you're close to the shoreline, avoiding a lot of minions as well. You'd wrap along on the top and go towards the blue line, which is meant for the rushes and going around into idle territory, being careful here. Although it is very forgiving that the idol does not chase you through the dark water or any other cornering parts. Going down, you would loop back through into a small island before looping back to spawn where you can once again teleport. Now, if you're an adrenaline junkie for Realm of the Mad God content, you will love this map type. You spawn in the same as Town in the bottom right hand side, and you can follow up on the purple line, going up along the right hand side, clearing up a bunch of monuments along with it. You follow along the top, and then join in to the rushing path on the left hand side, and follow down into what we call Swamp. Now, this is idle territory, so you've got to be very careful, making sure that you're watching all of the red dots on your map, and making sure that there is no idle slowly creeping in towards you. 
Other parts you want to be aware of are rogues and making sure that they don't jump on you as well, but I'll be talking about the other enemies very shortly. You can once again go through and wrap onto the right hand side where you'll regroup with your spawn and likely head up into town to do another clear again. Now that we've covered the maps, where you are and what you need to do, it's time to jump onto enemies. There are a ton of different enemies for you once you enter the dungeon, and you'll encounter many of these throughout the map as you continue on to the following bosses. Your minions will even sometimes respawn, and I'll cover that just very shortly. Your minions fall into these categories, hollow enemies and stone enemies. You can also get additional enemies, which are the Eye of the King, which is extremely dangerous and the Voided can carry a sickened aura, and also the Fire and Ice Magises, which will appear for the clear in the second boss as well. Careful these, because they're actually fairly dangerous. All the enemies I've listed, although dangerous in their current form, will only get aggroed once they're neared. They're fairly easy to clear with lower health, so don't worry about it too much. Now, moving on to a better picture for it, there's also a plus side. Each of these minions that I've mentioned so far, besides the voided ones, have a chance of dropping a white bag. Now, these white bags are actually fairly good. The hide classes drop a hide white, the heavy classes drop a heavy white, and, well, the mage classes drop a robe white. Now, if they're accursed, which is what I was mentioning before, or better known as voided, when they are so, they'll deal 50 to 100 more damage than what they normally would in their standard form. It's highly recommended that you take in the stun or going ahead and using day's classes. And keeping in mind that the hollows are immune to stun and stasis, whereas the stone minions are immune to paralyze and stasis. And finally, this brings us to the spooky boy of the shadows, the idol. The idol can be found in either one of the territories I covered before on the maps. So go ahead and check it out if you need to. Otherwise, make sure that if you do run into the idol, that you're running away immediately as this idol can't be damaged. Now, if you don't see the idol, making sure that when you're peeking through and looking for monuments, you are keeping a peeled eye for them, as what will happen is it'll sneak up very slowly behind you and not start shooting until it's activated. And that's it for clear. If I left anything out, please let me know in the comment section below. I feel like this is everything everyone needs to know for now, at least, and going through and being able to clear everything is a great way to be able to farm those whites. They're not the most common, but they are the most rewarding. So be sure to give it a try. Otherwise, we're gonna carry on with the first boss, so stick through with me on this. Ah, the Rich Sentinel. The first of all three bosses in the shadows and definitely the most sporadic of all three, as well as the most challenging in my opinion. I'll be covering each phase and phase cycle as in-depth as they need to be for this guide. Keep in mind that the boss does hurt quite a lot, so unless you're able to ninja your way through the shots, be sure to have a healing class or health potions at the ready. Once you've finished your clear, you'll be greeted with a notification saying that the bridge is now open. Go ahead and teleport at any one of the teleporters or walk up through the bridge to enter the first boss room. The boss won't be active straight away until you walk over the top of him, so use this time to familiarize yourself with the layout. From the get-go, experienced or new, get used to standing up at the top right of the boss about four to five tiles to the right of the sentinel. From here, it'll be easy to deal with the boss phase cycles, which are about to begin. And that brings me on to cycle A. The first phase cycle is called slashes or sweeps and obtains this name through its sweeping shot pattern. You can predict this phase will happen if the phase starts before the obelisk to the left of you is struck by lightning. Be very careful during this phase as the sentinel itself can lock you in with petrify shots and deal damage ranging from 150 to 250 damage. So be careful not to get lined up and back out to the bottom of the room if you're feeling uncomfortable. Once the phase is finished, the sentinel will spin on spot and start rotating around the room, bouncing off the room's edges, shooting crescent-shaped shots that accelerate outwards. Now, believe it or not, the safest place to stand for this phase is actually in the very center. Take fungal tones with you and make sure you plant them down so that, that way people can lead their shots. Once the boss is finished bouncing around the room, they'll rotate in the center and move back to the top of the room. Now, this next phase is called Swords Phase, and it'll make sense very quickly. In this phase, swords will start falling from the top of the boss room. If they highlight blue, they'll fall from top to bottom. If they highlight red, however, they'll curve towards the middle of the room. So be very careful when you're going through safe spots. Now, as far as I'm aware, you can't stand still anywhere around the map. So if you do know a spot, let me know in the comment section below. But otherwise from that, you have one of two choices here. Push in and take damage from the slight hilt there, or you can go ahead and just push in through the gaps wherever possible. After this, the phase cycles will reset and you can have either A or B. So let's get on to B. To tell if cycle B is going to start at the beginning, the obelisk will get struck by lightning before the phase begins. This is a really good chance to back up as the boss will begin leaping onto the group, slamming down on the ground, creating a barrage of shots that deal for 175 per. 
The boss will leap 11 times in total before changing phase, and this phase is usually obstructed for melee classes to push in, so as I said, unless you're a ninja, be very careful, and uh, this is more reliant on range. Once the boss has leaped 11 times, he'll move into the center of the map, where we will begin his next phase, Cardinals. This is where the boss summons a large ring of spinning golden swords around the edges of the arena, which will start slowly launching themselves at the player one by one in a counterclockwise order. He then summons several waves of golden swords in various other formations, which spin in place before launching themselves at the player. Now the patterns he uses are always fixed, so I'll go ahead and explain them to you in order. Now keep in mind throughout this entire fight, it's a really good chance to get damage as it's one of the safest phases of all of them. That being him stationary, you have a chance to set up with fungal tomes, M seals, everything that you need to get yourself situated. To begin, a small ring of swords will appear around the boss, launching one at a time in a clockwise order, which will be repeated twice before carrying on to the next phase. And this is where it gains its name. Swords will now form in lines stretching along each of the cardinal directions, with all swords firing simultaneously. Now gear up, because this phase also repeats itself twice. And finally, a large ring of swords around him will form, launching one at a time in a clockwise order, alongside a second large ring identical to the one summoned at the start of the phase. After Cardinals finishes, the boss will then quickly spin around the room, bouncing off all edges, rapidly firing various rings of crescents that turn into accelerating bolts after a small delay. At the end of this attack, he then slows down and then circles in the center, if this isn't sounding familiar, with small little gaps to go ahead and weave through. I hope you can preempt these phases now and at least give it a try. Get used to these and start pushing in the correct locations or backing out where you need to be safe. Now as you're dealing damage to the boss, he will become invulnerable at boss health percentages 80, 60, 40 and 20, where obelisks will become vulnerable during this. It is required that you destroy the obelisk in order to continue dealing damage to the boss. Now do be careful, as when you do crumble an obelisk, they will spawn blow bombs, which will seek you out and explode. They will also spawn periodically throughout the fight, so it's pretty important that you activate them either by dashing over them very quickly, or shooting them to avoid making your boss fight even more dangerous. Now, there's a certain order that we like to follow for obelisks, and it's more or less to make it safer, and I'll get to why. That order is bottom right, bottom left, top left, and top right. This helps for when you have to push for cycle A phases, and means that you won't have to look out for blow bombs spawning on top of you. Now after explaining your phases and objectives, I'm now going to go on to what's called Rage Phase. Rage Phase is guaranteed once you push the boss past 40-50% to 50 HP. Now past this phase, you can blast it all the way through skipping Rage. However, if you don't, Rage will start after a phase cycle has finished. Now, don't be scared, because Rage has its own repeat cycle, and they're fairly easy to avoid if you know what you're doing. To begin, the boss will move to the top of the screen, and the screen will go slightly dark. This is how you know it's going to be Rage Face. He'll then raise his sword and jump on the players, slashing five times before leaping at the closest player and slamming the ground, this time throwing out petrify fireballs alongside the standard barrage of shots. After five slashes, the boss will then rotate around the room, slamming into the walls. Every time he hits one of the arena borders, he'll release a massive ring of black shot chains. Be careful not to get lined up with these or the trail of golden swords that he leaves in his wake as he rotates. Once he finishes rotating, he will repeat the same phases again twice. However, on the final repeat phase leaps, the Sentinel will leap twice, so be very careful to prioritize dodging on the Petrify projectiles, as you could likely get sat on. During these phases, be very careful of blow bombs. You can go ahead and stand in the center for a nice little safe spot and lead your shots. Wait for him to do slashes, and then go around again and bait him. If you finish this rage phase before killing the boss, then the screen will go back to being bright and the boss will return to normal phases. So be careful not to get leaped onto once again once rage is finished. By now, you might have even killed the bridge sentinel, and if you haven't, on death what you're looking for is him to crumple over and finally collapse. Before he perishes, you have a little bit of time to pop your clovers and have a little bit of an extra loot chance. Blow bombs will stop spawning and this is a safe space for you to catch your breath. At this point, the bridge will open and you'll be able to head in to continue to the royal castle. As you cross the bridge, you will enter an overgrown courtyard staffed with stone minions and mages, another enemy type which we'll be covering very shortly. The stone walkways feature a green carpet which guides your way to the central chamber. A tip for this area is to hug the right hand wall all the way up to the central chamber and avoid most of the minions if you can. Once you're in the central chamber, you'll notice a dark flame in the center of the room with four unpowered magi generators. 
In order to start the boss fight, you'll need to have three flames available in each of the Magi generators, but we'll get to that very shortly. On the first arriving, you'll notice that there are two wings on either side of the chamber, and one flame found in each wing. The location will vary depending on which wings you have, and well, <laughs> yes, that's right. The wings aren't guaranteed, meaning that each wing can be one of 10 different wing maps. I won't be covering all wings here, but I will summarize how to deal with them, what to look out for, and which wings are best in order, as you will have to nominate one wing that you won't be clearing, and it's safe to know which one takes the longest, or which ones are the most difficult to do. The wings are represented by these flags. I've categorized the flags in order of priority from left to right. Puzzle, Wine Cellar, Laboratory, Treasury, Lockup, Armory, Dining Hall, Living Quarters, and library. All if not most of the flags have the same process, however there is one thing that I'm going to have to cover and that is puzzle. Puzzle is or can be extremely fast and it gains the name from entering a square room and being quizzed on a 3x3 light speed puzzle. You can beat this puzzle by tapping each of the conductors to find out the correct algorithm or I provided a link below which you can go ahead and take a look at for a light speed puzzle solver online. Additionally if you want to save all the trouble at all you can just go on to the remaining wing and do that one instead. In all cases, you'll be required to clear enemies until you reach the source conductors. Source conductors once destroyed will release hold of one out of four different types of flames. Your first is three green flames that give healing to all nearby players. Each flame moves at a slightly different speed so it makes dragging the flame a little bit harder than normal. A red flame that inflicts bleeding to all nearby players this flame is slightly slower than the other flames, so it does take a little bit longer as well. There's also a yellow flame that inflicts armor broken to all nearby players. Unlike the other flames, it doesn't need to be moved onto, and it will just go to the next conductor automatically as long as you're clearing it. Additionally, it's also faster than all the other flames, so it's pretty lucky if you do get it. Another one is a blue flame that grants energize to all nearby players, but periodically emits rings of paralyzing shots, every time it moves. From destroying the source conductors, you'll notice that other conductors along the way have opened up, and you'll notice that there is a link or at least a line of particles between each one. You'll need to follow these and destroy them. Once you attack the conductors to activate them, stand on the flame to move the flame back towards the Magi generators in the boss room. Keep in mind that if the conductor is not cleared for the flame, the flame will simply just not move. One annoying factor about the clear is that any minions remaining or voided minions that may have respawned can actually go ahead and attack these conductors. If they do successfully attack and destroy these activated conductors, it'll reset your flame and it'll take it back to spawn. You'll have to start again so be very careful, also being wary that when a flame is deactivated and does respawn, it'll detonate before going back. Now this takes us to enemies. You'll encounter mages specifically in this segment of the Shadows, which is quite fitting for its theme. Splitting the enemies up again into groups, there are Ice Mages, Fire Mages, and Nobles. Additionally, you can also have those Hollows appear again in the form of Rogues, so be very careful of invisible minions throughout your journey clearing. There might also be, additionally, Ice Spheres, Fire and Ice Portals, Ice Spikes, and fire bombs that are spawned in phases by fire and ice mages. One of my favorite minions to come from the shadows is actually one of the most deceiving minions, the Pard. The Barb will dash at players dealing no damage but instead playing a tune. Now this tune actually summons all nearby enemies to your current location and then the Bard runs away. If the player clears out all the minions and angers the Bard for long enough, the enemy will begin playing the old ROTMG theme song, Sorcerer's Tower while playing notes that deal a respectable amount of damage and quiet the player. I think it's also worth mentioning that every single one of the enemies that you currently face in this section of the dungeon can be voided, so additionally they can deal 50 to 100 more damage than what they would normally do, or be more sporadic than usual. So be careful of these. I do have to stress to you that voided minions will respawn, no matter what you do, so make sure that you're leaving breadcrumbs behind or being very, very quick with your clears. After you have successfully dragged three flames back to the boss room, the boss activates and you might be thinking, hold up, what about those who breadcrumbed for us? Did they miss the fight? Well, no, you see, everyone within a radius of the first boss will be teleported back to the chamber, meaning you can successfully deal with the flame clears and all the other nit bits without worry about haste on the way back. Now onto the boss fight. 
You'll start off with about 300,000 HP as a solo, and it'll slightly HP scale through that. Through most of that, he's going to be pushed back after you've beaten him back or his minions through certain phases. Now, this takes us to phases. I'm going to split the Archmage's phases into these categories. Damage Wall Phases, Magi Generator, Fire 2 Generators, Fire 3 Generators, Ice 2 Generators, Ice 3 Generators, and finally, no pun included, Finale Phases. Now I will try to clarify that there are two phases underneath most of the phase subsections, so if one happens, expect the other. I'll expand on this shortly. Now you're probably wondering when can I damage the phase? Well, that leads us on to damageable phases. The boss will be damageable during his phases until 70%. Then, the boss will end up spawning an Inferno or Blizzard Bird which will wander the boss room during his phases and require to be killed in order to damage the boss again. This will be repeated 3 times throughout 2-3 to three phases before capping off again at 40%. The boss will then repeat the same process, throwing the same phases at you, except this time giving you both Inferno and Blizzard to chase after and kill in order to once again damage the boss until his health reaches 10%. Now onto Magi Generators. Magi Generators are what control which phase you're going to get before you get it. You can tell which phase you're going to get if you look at the colors of the Magi Generators. For example, if one is blue and the others are red, that means that the fire phase is incoming, and vice versa. After doing three successful phases with good damage to the boss, he caps off as we mentioned at health percentages 70, 40, and 10. A neat way that I've heard from a raid leader named Gund is right above Archmage in the H, you can see that there's 70%. Right above the Twilight at the end of the T, you can see that it's 40%. And if you look above the W in Twilight as well, there's your 10%. A neat little way of remembering it. During these caps and if done correctly, the screen will turn dark and a sickening and bleeding aura will trigger until you destroy one of the magi generators. Also be wary as the magi generators themselves will shoot out shots, so it's pretty important that you preempt this and get ready to destroy the correct generators depending on what phases you want to have more of in the future. Keeping in mind that locking off these generators also determine which finale phase you're going to have later on as well. Alright, now that we've talked about everything between the phases during the fight, let's talk about the actual phases themselves. We'll start with fire phases with two generators. The first phase is called fire rotates. Fire rotates is where the Archmage summons five fire portals rotating along the room's edges that shoot streams of fire shots inwards to form a five armed clockwise spiral. The Archmage himself will periodically fire two six rings of flame vortices that inflict sick and bleeding. So watching out for those and you can't miss them, they're massive while also throwing out firebombs and rings of eight, which detonate into short range explosions after a brief fuse time. The firebombs are thrown at close, medium, and far distances on a cycle. If you scream rotate confidently, you'll have no problem with this phase. Range definitely dominates during this phase, so during all three phases, attacking birds is pretty easy. The second phase we're covering is called scatter bombs. This is where the Archmage summons three fire portals to rotate clockwise closer to him, periodically pulsing rings of accelerating fire waves and regular small fire blasts. He will also sporadically be launching firebombs randomly all over the arena, while firing small shotguns of flaming blasts and a clockwise pattern on the outside. During this phase, in the beginning, it's important to stay pushed up for damage to the end of the phase quickly. If you're dealing with birds, put your back to any one of the walls, watching out for bombs, and as the birds rotate around the outside, you can rotate alongside them, dealing slow and dealing damage. Now for 3 gen fire phases, your first one is called Fire Nuke. In this phase, the boss will release a barrage of small fireballs in all directions which follow turning trajectories. He will also be firing periodically three-way flame vortices that armor break and summoning three-shot rows of slow blue spinners from the walls of the arenas. There will also be eight invincible fire portals rotating around counterclockwise around the arena, pulsing short-ranged fire shots. The second 3 gen phase is called Firewalls. During firewalls, get ready as the boss fires two streams of fire waves along the horizontal and vertical axes and summoning slowing blue spinners from the outside of the arena. As eight fire portals rotate around counterclockwise on the edges of the arena and pulse short ranged fire bursts to trap players within them. Dense rows of armor piercing fire waves then fly across the arena from both sides, which have a gap to dodge through. These rows alternate between coming from either side and perfectly cover each other's safe spots, forcing players to weave between the alternating walls of shots. The bullet rows will terminate with the Archmage throwing out a number of firebombs around him, so be sure to preempt and dodge these when pushing in either on the boss or on the birds. 
This attack alternates between firing along the horizontal and vertical directions, or vice versa, so be sure that you position yourself on the side where the birds will be most present. Now into ice phases for two generators. Both ice phases feature portals, however this one is disintegrates. This is where the Archmage starts summoning ice portals in groups of two or four, which fly in opposite directions while periodically firing full wave shotguns of armor-piercing ice along cardinal or diagonal directions. The Archmage himself will periodically fire three faster rings of silencing icy twirls that rotate in opposite directions. Be careful not to sit on top of any of these portals as you'll obtain the most valuable thing in Realm of the Magod, and that's a free character slot. Get it? Because you die and... Yeah. The second phase is unironically called Rotating Portals. It's called that because, well, that's exactly what it is. The portals will pulse silencing AoE attacks and periodically fire small bolts and more damaging frost waves in two directions, both of which armor pierce and silence. The outer portals will fire them in four directions instead. The Archmage himself, however, will periodically be firing slow blue stars in random directions. Now there is a safe spot, one tile, bottom left of boss, in which you can stand on that little green carpet and just weave slightly in between the slow blue moving stars and you'll be able to damage them quite easily from there, otherwise you're just chasing around the birds. Now in terms of 3 gen ice phases, your first is called Ice Nuke. Similar to Fire Nuke, the boss summons 6 ice portals that pulse AoE attacks while firing slow clusters of icy twirls aimed at the player, alternating between rotating clockwise around the edges of the room and rotating near the center. The Archmage will also be spawning special invisible ice spheres around the map which grow in size before exploding in directed shotguns of icicles aimed at the player. Now here's a funny one. This next one is called Arena. The Archmage traps all players inside a ring of stationary ice spinners while maintaining a second ring near him, made of three clockwise rotating streaks of spinners. Six ice portals along the room's edges rotate clockwise, firing short-ranged ice blasts in all directions while firing single accelerating purple spinners in unison to create converging ring shots. Additionally, the Archmage himself will rapidly fire various beams of shots in multiple directions made up of ice wave and several small bolts. These beams can be shots fired in three, six, and eight directions at once. And uh, I hate to say it, but this phase basically renders almost all melee classes useless to damage unless you're using, I don't know, a Dr. Swordsworth, or you might be able to reach with a divinity. Huh, who would have thought? All right, well, that wraps up our phases here. Now on to the birds. Inferno and Blizzard. The minion suffered by the Archmage during the fight in order to protect himself. The birds will start popping up after the boss has reached his 70% damage cap. Killing them become part of the objective to damage the boss, and during so, they will circle the boss, throwing out shots to void you off from pushing in. Once you've completed all three phases and tackled the boss down to 10% HP, the two birds become damageable in order depending on which finale you have chosen. Regardless of which phase you've chosen, the blue bird will be the most aggro on the players, versus the red bird which will go ahead and rotate around either on the outside or the inside. If you've chosen the fire phase, then you'll need to kill the blue bird first, and then go for the red bird and vice versa if you chose the ice phase. Okay, two tips real quick. One, for the ice bird finale, stun and slow Inferno on the outside to avoid being armor broken and railed by Blizzard. Two, for fire bird finale, bring a stun and slow for Inferno and Blizzard so you avoid being railed. Notice the similarity? In final phase when killing the birds, Inferno can be stunned and it's important to do so in order to protect squishy classes to push in, especially on fire when there's bombs that are active and thrown out so you have less to deal with. Finally, on to finale phases. Not the pun intended, of course. We'll start with fire finale. Treat this one similar to firewalls, but radials. This is where the Archmage divides the room vertically with a line of fire waves as eight fire portals rotate counterclockwise around the edges of the room, firing short range shots to make staying at edges fatal. Each of the lines of fire waves then split up into a large number of smaller segments which start traveling around the room in a circular pattern with each segment circling at a different distance from the middle, forming a dense network of rotating shots that players must weave through. The Archmage will also periodically be throwing firebombs, so it's pretty important just to preempt those. Another thing is that the Archmage won't become damageable until the first firebomb has been thrown, so don't get intimidated by this phase. Staying left or right hand side directly in a cardinal style is the best place to be and back out or rotate if you encounter bombs. And now we'll go on to Ice Finale. This phase really kills off the idea for melee to push in more frequently, so I kind of recommend doing this in selective groups where you've got more range. The Archmage spawns eight ice portals that rotate counterclockwise around the perimeter, 
firing an extremely dense randomized barrage of icy twirls and icy vortices inward. The portals also fire out spreads of ice bolts behind them to stop players from hiding behind them. The Archmage himself will also be periodically launching ice spheres that explode into directed spreads of ice shards shortly upon landing. The best place to be for this phase is at the bottom, right underneath the boss, and making sure that you've got fungal tomes, M seals, that sort of stuff set up if you have it, otherwise just pushing in where you can, weaving in between the shots. Don't be afraid to rotate and push away if you need to. Once you've completed these finales, the boss will die with a neat animation giving you enough time to pop your clovers again. Your loot will drop in the center, and once you do so, you can head into the Grand Hall. The Grand Hall, better known as the Gauntlet. This is a large hallway leading into the throne room that is surrounded by a moat of corruption. There are eight pillars extending down the hall with a green carpet in the middle. Once you're inside, on the green carpet there you will see a tablet in the center. Once the tablet is damaged, your gauntlet will begin. Several enemies with high damage properties and sporadic behavior will come out of sealed halls and aim to attack you. You'll notice that once you destroy the first tablet, a bar at the top left will be filled to show you what your objective is now. Tablets will spawn scattered all around the hall and your job is to destroy the tablets and deal with the minions. Now I'm not really going to be covering the minions, but what I will say about them is the ones you should look out for are necromancers that spawn skulls seeking out players, hog riders, minions on horses that will charge you, and gladiators that spring chains of shots that armor break first and easily damage you through to kill you quite quickly. Minions can also spawn on top of the tablets after destroying your third tablet, so be very careful not to EP or sit on tablets after you've destroyed that third one. It's also worth mentioning that each of these tablets have a nice chance of dropping the Shatter's Armors and Reskin Decades Ring. Once you've destroyed the last tablet, the minions will despawn and the gate will open to the throne room. The boss awaits for you in his final room, sitting on his throne. The Cursed King. The third and final boss in the Shatter's. Be sure to get ready as this one sounds simple, but it takes a bit of a process and although there is a lot to cover, I'll do my best I can to warn you on what to look out for. I'll be cutting these down to subsections as I have with the previous Shatters bosses. Starting with pre-voided phases, floor plans, scale phases, voided phases, patience, and finally death. Pre-voided phases. The phase types will change with different floor plans, but its characteristic remains the same and will not change pre-void. They go as follows. Neutral phase. The color yellow dealing high damage projectiles wandering about the room and cardinals or diagonally with no change in its walking path and with no apparent aggro. The second is chase phase, represented by the color red. is almost a polar opposite of that phase that I've said prior, where the boss will chase the nearest player with reasonable damage and debuffs sicken, slow, and armor break depending on which phase it is. The third is called stationaries, represented by the color blue and is a really good phase to push in on, no matter what class you're playing. Watching out for certain shots should be one of your mains, as some of them can go ahead and quiet you and also curse you again, depending on which phase it is. The fourth is called Reflectors, or as I call them, Refractors, and I'll get to that really soon so you understand. This phase is the color green, and it's where the boss will move from one side of the map to the other side of the map, while spinning around and whatever damage is dealt to it during this phase is also returned out in a barrage of shots. So, it's best to be avoiding this phase if you're a melee class. Now that we've gone and covered each phase, let's go ahead and move on to floor plans. Now, I can hear you sitting there thinking, hmm, what's a floor plan? And well, to be honest, that would make sense. You see, the definition of a floor plan is to describe the arrangement of a room. Through all eight phases, there will be different arrangements in the room itself, which has projectiles that are required to be looked out for, making the king more tricky to deal with. These four plans can change roughly every 30 seconds to one other than itself, and it has no set cycle. This means that you can go through many of the unfavorable four plans, however many times it will take for the boss to be damaged down to 50% HP. Now I failed to mention there are eight floor plans. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cover them all in order, starting with number one, small grids. Small grids are these evenly spaced yellow crystals which fire shots between each other to form a dense interlocking grid while four blue crystals in each corner of the room fire messy shotguns inward. Now, it sounds really hard, but it isn't. It's actually one of the most free phases out of all of them, so enjoy it. Your second one is called small rotates. 
Now, a lot of people mess this one up, so I do my best to explain and show what I can. After indicators consisting of harmless orange spinners shoot out as a warning, a massive cross shape of white bullets divides the arena in four as eight yellow crystals spawn in, in a ring pattern around the room. The white bullets turn into shards and split into two crosses that rotate in opposite directions with evenly spaced gaps within each arm. The yellow crystals will move back and forth between the edge and the center of the room, firing three-way bursts of yellow bolts and waves. And a green crystal in the very center of the room will be pulsing rings of returning green orbs. Your third floor plan is five tentacles. In this phase, four red crystals in the corners and one in the center begin firing periodic six-armed clockwise spirals of red shards. Four yellow crystals rotate around the inner circle of the room, periodically stopping to fire four-way lines of yellow shots along the cardinal directions. Four blue crystals additionally on the cardinal points of the room will fire aimed bursts of blue shards. Your fourth phase is called big grids, and it's the exact same as small grids. Nine yellow crystals are summoned in an evenly spaced matrix, firing yellow bolts to form an interlocking grid pattern along with single aimed blasts. Your fifth floor plan is called Single Tentacle. A red crystal in the center of the room begins firing periodic six-way streams of red shards and a six-way burst of whitish bullets, some of which follow the carving patterns. Number six is floor plan Walled Gardens. Makes things a little bit more dangerous. Eight red crystals circle counterclockwise around the edges of the room, firing short-range streams of shots inward along the synchronized bursts of whitish blasts that converge in the center of the room. Meanwhile, green crystals will be appearing and disappearing in various configurations in the center of the room. Each one generates a flashing diamond-shaped field of harmless spinners as a warning. The spinners will turn bright green and hazardous for a few seconds after a warning time and then despawn shortly after. Now, number seven, big rotates, is a little bit like the small rotates. The only real difference is the six red crystals also spin around the edges of the room, firing shots towards the walls, while the green crystal in the very middle pulses and basically just shoots out more shots. Finally, the eighth and last floor plan, the nicer version, open gardens. Four red crystals at cardinal points of the rooms fire turning rings of red shards, while four blue crystals in the corners fire aimed beams of blue waves. At the same time, four green crystals periodically appear with a diamond-shaped field of flashing spinners as a warning. The spinners then become green, damaging for a few seconds after the delay, before the crystals despawn and appear again after a few seconds later. The positioning of the green crystals shifts by 45 degrees each time they despawn. So really watch out for crystals here and try not to get sickened. Now that we've covered each of the phases and floor plans, it's time to go on to scale phase. After damaging the boss down to 50% HP, the king instantly stops whatever attack he was using, despawning all crystals as he moves to the top of the room. At this point, he will have a small animation, giving you a little bit of time to get ready for what's called scale phase. The king turns into a massive scale that will be aggroed on the nearest player. Now, not only does the king do a lot of damage, but he also armor breaks for 3 seconds. Additionally, the king also spawns in minions around the map, called helpless souls, that can inflict sicken and bleeding for 3 seconds. Now it's worth the warning that the phase will continue and the king will be more persistent in his pursuit for the nearest player. He has the ability to launch himself at players periodically, so be very careful and try and preempt this jump. The easiest way to deal with this phase is to kite the boss upon morphing into the skull to the top of the room and around the outskirts in a clockwise direction and crossing through the middle if you need to deal with minions there as well. I recommend having over 50 speed or the ability to boost your speed to get away from the boss if needed. Now this brings us to the accursed phases or better known as the voided phases. Once the eyes have all been killed, the king will move to the center and revert to his original form, but this time becoming accursed and spawning in four minions called shades. The king will randomly be alternating between six attack phases as he did before, but this time without stances and attacks enhanced. The first phase being reflectors. The king will enter his reflectors stance and the shades of the king spread out and start patrolling the map alongside straight paths, alternating between moving along horizontal and vertical paths. The king himself will be rotating around the room, firing spreads of purple flames towards the edges of the room and attacking nearby players with massive aimed purple blasts, 
Additionally, V-shaped lines of red orbs which extend and converge in a scissor-like motion. The shades will also fire blue vortices towards the edges of the room, leaving behind trails of stationary purple blades which accelerate towards players after a short delay. During this phase, you can either choose to group up at the bottom and make sure to dodge the big purple shotguns and the tentacles that spawn out from the ground. Alternatively, you can also rotate around and avoid the big purple shotguns as well as the red lines and swing in the middle of the room. Gadakiri has multiple different shot patterns, however generally speaking you want to stay within the light blue shots that form a wall on each end and dodge the big red circles that slowly cross around the room. This phase is mostly just micro dodging, however if the king shoots singular red shots that have gaps in between them, then this is a good phase to try and push up and do as much DPS as possible. Otherwise, there are no real instances where you'll be able to push in as a melee, so try to buff your group or dodge for now and push in for damage after. Our third phase is called Tentacles. The king remains in the center of the room and fires six armed spirals of purple flames that slowly rotate clockwise, forcing people to rotate with it. He will also be firing both blue and red wavy scale projectiles in a full way burst which return to him after reaching the walls of his arena. The Shades of the King, on the other hand, will rotate clockwise around the room, firing an inward spiral of blue arrowheads to complement the King's projectiles himself, as well as shorter range streams of red arrowheads. The converging spiral from the Shades has a periodic gap within it, allowing players to dodge through them. Note that he will go invulnerable for the remainder of this phase if players deal too much damage, approximately 8% of his health, by the way. It's important to remember that red shots will curse you, and blue shots will also quiet you. The fourth phase is called Abyss. During this phase, the shades rotate counterclockwise around the edges of the room, firing rings of stagnating blue bolts and red orbs towards the walls of the arena, as well as large purple flame blasts that start stagnant and accelerate towards the center of the room. The shades will also periodically launch white bombs which spawn diamond-shaped patches of void tendrils, which after a delay deal massive AoE damage. The king himself will chase players firing four-way arrows made of smaller arrow hits, red ones along the diagonal directions and blue ones along the cardinal directions. What you to do for Abyss is rotate clockwise on the inner and just watch out for the ping shots and you'll likely avoid everything else. Now, before I get into these final two phases, I call them Fury, as more often than not, especially on repeat phases, not being able to tell the difference between the two phases is immediately pretty apparent. Now introducing the fifth phase called Fury Swipes. The Shades of the King group up in the center of the arena and start rotating counterclockwise, firing pairs of blue shots outward. The King himself will chase players, alternating between rings of blue and red arrowheads that rotate in opposite directions, and aim shotguns of purple fire blasts. Alternating directions, Fury Swipes. Now on to our sixth and final accursed phase, Fury stance. The four shades will appear at corners of the room and fire purple bolts between each other to form a square shape. They'll alternate between the corners of the room and the center, changing their additional attacks depending on their position. They'll fire three-way lines of blue waves when at the corners, rings of turning blue shots in the center, and nothing while moving. In the meantime, the king himself will cycle through three attacks in order. One, creating several dense rings of red and blue bolts centered at random positions near him which predominantly accelerate and fire outwards and is pretty nasty. Two, firing two radial bursts of twirls, one red and one blue. The twirls will start rotating in opposite directions after flying for enough time with the red burst having a much longer range. And three, firing a ring of purple blades that slow down and stagnates after a bit. Now let's move on to the celestial of this dungeon. And by this, I mean literally the nightmare of a fight but yet somehow the most satisfying once you complete it. Now don't worry, we all entered this dungeon with the same impression you have and most of us have left completing it over and over again. You will get better every time you do it. So trust me and I'll share some of my pain, I sorry, I mean knowledge upon you. Let me welcome you to Patience. Test the Patience is a bullet hell micro dodging phase of the King's fight where the King centers himself in the center of the room and the screens become tinted red. All players will then be sickened and silenced for the attack's duration. Void tendrils flood the edges of the room, firing solid walls of shots backwards and armor-piercing arrowheads that travel in a straight line forming an erratic red pattern. Keeping in mind red arrows will inflict bleeding and the blue ones will deal increased damage. The shades on the other hand position themselves in the corners of the room, alternating between slow rings of red and blue arrowheads that curse and pierce armor. Respectively, 
The shades will alternate between remaining still at the corners and slowly following nearby players, alternating between states three times. Now in theory I could continue teaching you everything you need to know via this video, but in actuality you need practicality in order to give it a shot and learn for yourself. So I'll show you a few videos and a few examples of what you need to do in a group or on your own, but give it a try for yourself and see how you feel about it. I do have a simulator on me right now that I could chuck a link to for people to download, so let me know if that's something that you'd want in the comment section below and I'll do just that. Now, I personally haven't finished a solo myself. I always seem to Nexus just before Patience or just after, which is really annoying. But what I will say is that Patience is a bit of a free for all. Here's a small simulator showing what I mean. You have multiple shades that can go after you and so little time to deal with them. So what I will say is if you have to tank anything, making sure you're taking non-minion projectiles and taking only blues. Dealing a red means that you're going to take bleeding and actually take more damage in the long run. Taking a minions, well, that's just not going to end well for you. Once Patience is finished, the King will return to his normal phases until he is finally defeated. So be sure to hang in there because once the King is defeated, he has by far one of the best death animations I have ever seen upon changing into a chest-like crown. Well everyone, that wraps it up for this guide. The Shatters dungeon is such a wild and diverse dungeon with so much glory to be explored. I really enjoyed making this guide and I hope you can learn a lot from it. Look, if I had anything to say, it would be take it slow, try it out on testing on the testing weekends, build familiarity, or just go full guns blazing. I encourage you to skip through this video and watch parts that you might want to revise upon before going in. Or even better, share this video to someone who might be interested in it. Thanks everyone. This has been your life of ROTMG with Souls. I'll see you in the next one. Peace. <laughs> You're just killing these faces, dude. Literally just place Genesis in the center here, dodge, stay mid-range, you'll be like, chilling. Dude, we're like, mass curing this. I got bomb on me, so I had to back out. Oh shit. Funny thing, Genesis is still- No, 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 no! <laughs> no! Fuck! <laughs>